Got it. There's something about that reporting and recording in progress that always makes me like startled. Uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for showing up on such short notice. And I, as the night starts, I am um, I'm sort of blown away by the number of people that came at such short notice, but the uh, influence that a lot of the people that are here have already had in this community. Um, I'm seeing some very impressive names, and I'm 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 going to geek out for a little second. Okay, I'm back. Um, so welcome. So you are here. We are here to talk um, curriculum, which is our very most next important phase in all the work that has been done so far. And I have been tasked happily um, with hosting this with Karen Bates. And Karen, if you don't mind, if you would just give us a little synopsis of what you've been up to and how we got here. Um, so it's completely a pleasure to um, be here tonight, and thank you again to everybody who turned out. Um, I am a sort of, I, I have a hard time even knowing quite how to introduce myself because I've worn a lot of hats in the K-12 space. That's why I made you do it. Hmm? <laughs> why I made you do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I've been everything from, um, I've done my time working for a combination of not-for-profits and for-profits in the literacy space uh, and in K-12 generally. And in the last handful of years, I've chosen to kind of go out on my own and focus on advocacy and focus on supporting, effectively fanning the flames of this science of reading movement in a number of different ways. Um, but um, I, I have also occupied a space where I have the privilege of having seen most of the high quality, virtually all of the high quality curricula in a lot of different contexts. So um, with some degree of pride, I, I uh, am, have the privilege of, again, knowing the high quality curriculum space better than most, and also trying to uh, you know, keep abreast of what is maybe the fastest changing space in all of K-12 education. So, we really are lucky to have you and all of your experience and all that you have learned and know. Um, from where you sit, where how do you see the biggest trends from 2023 in this particular space when we're looking at and talking about curriculum? So anybody who knows me knows that I'm, you know, a slide addict and I, um, I can talk all day and riff all day, but I also like you press the button, I can talk all day. So slides help me keep myself kind of honest and on task. So I'm gonna address, oh shoot. Um, I also am like woefully terrible at technology. So let me just share my screen before. Slides are our friends. And technology hey. hates. So it's this weird dichotomy that we all live in. I know. So I just spent a little bit of time um, compiling the top journalism of 2023. And I had to stop myself and like press pause on writing after I hit 28 articles because um, mm. it, it was too much to talk about. And that's a reflection of this growth in journalism that we saw. And that is in fact, one of our trends. But the other big trend is that so many things were trending that also engendered the journalistic surge. Um, so if I had to do a highlight reel on 2023, um, it will surprise no one if you follow me that the trends that felt important weren't necessarily all the ones that were reported on, but we'll talk a bit about both. Um, I think the big story of 2023 was phonics patching. In a, mm -hmm. in a development that's a complete blessing, and I don't say that lightly, districts are attending to the issues with foundational skills that are the main focus of national reporting in 2023, as it was the most, uh, pregnant topic in 2020, 21, and 22. Um, so the good news is districts are getting that memo, but the dominant behavior seems to be districts investing in foundational skills improvements, but not necessarily the rest. Right. And right. I talk about that as phonics patching because I think it's the best shorthand. Um, I will take any gain in any arena. So this one, I, I don't want to say this disparagingly, but I want to say it honestly, that I feel like we're we're tackling one or maybe 1.5 parts of the problem in most districts. Um, 
we have a hard time knowing what the second biggest trend is. In fact, I'm on a lot of calls where we debate this. Um, in ways that we'll talk about later, there aren't a lot of good sources for information about K-12 curriculum usage trends. So when we talk about whether the next biggest trend is um, a shift toward basal readers, or is it actually a shift towards knowledge building curricula, that's an open question that I've been asking a number of different research organizations and even nudging journalists to try to get into from an investigative journalism perspective. We know the following three things to be true. There is a decrease in usage of, um, or a, a decreasing market share for um, the, you know, balanced literacy stalwarts. We know there are districts moving away from reading workshop and f &P. We don't know what volumes they're moving away in, but we know that there's a decrease. What we don't know, again, besides the, sh the magnitude of the decrease is where are they going? We do know that basal readers are enjoying a surge. We've seen a number of adoptions of programs from major publishers, from you know, the interreadings to the benchmark advances and so forth. And we've seen increasing market share for the curricula that we describe as knowledge building. For knowledge, wit and wisdom, EL education, our core, um, bookworms. But no one knows which of those two is the bigger trend. And in fact, there are indicators that suggest um, mixed things about which is the bigger trend. So uh, I also think one of the big questions about 2023 and 2024 is some of that, what's really happening in the details. Um, and if you know um, a good research institution, push them to answer the question. Go ahead. Compare uh, Basil to anthology. That was a good question. I apologize that I'm not watching the chat. I'm watching my slides. No, I got, um, hey, it's why they pay me the big bucks. You know what's funny? Um, I one of my favorite conversations today was someone nudging me that about the need to redefine basils because we talked about basil readers as if they were highly similar to anthologies. Um, and there's a heavy overlap. Traditionally, we talked about basil readers as the thing used in K5. So basils were shorthand for K5, anthologies were shorthand for the textbook like thing that was a curation of um, you know, texts and passages to be used in middle and upper grades. That's the traditional definition. But when we talk about basils in 2023, a lot of these new programs are even heavily ed tech influenced. And so, you know, this generation is not your mom's basil reader. Right. And I'm not even sure that basil reader is the right descriptor right. for the later generation of what's coming out of publishers. Right. But in general, it's a set of programs that is not necessarily the most rigorous thing at this point in response to market developments. We can talk about this a bit more. Most of the current generation of basils is something that didn't do well in ed reports a couple of years ago. So publishers stuffed more stuff into it. Mm -hmm. And now it's just an overstuffed burrito that's a mix of nutritious stuff and non-nutritious stuff. And no teacher could finish it in a year. So, you know, you just hope that the, the bites that come out uh, in classrooms are nutritious. Um, terrible metaphor but i ran with it <laughs> so it worked so basil's generally I'm hungry but it did work particularly as this as, as what the traditional publishers are bringing to market are decidedly growing in market share i think we need to get much more precise about what those programs look like um their distinctive characteristics and what do we know about their growth and by the way, this is a great way of previewing what I think will be the big trend of 2024. So stay till the end. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna just like run through the rest of this because we have lots to talk about and we totally wanna save time for discussion with a crowd that is so many thoughtful people that I'd rather I'd rather be like stopping talking now and asking you all your opinions, but I did promise to share some things. Um, we saw a lot of big research in 2023 um, the two big research categories that I think were worth paying attention to, we saw a number of different studies showing us that if you designed curricula to build children's knowledge, proactively building foundational knowledge in sciences and history, um, that that did in fact drive comprehension gains. Um, Jimmy Kim, uh, the Grismer study out of Colorado, these were two of multiple studies that came out in 2023 showing that. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't seeing a lot of people drawing a through line through those studies, but 
that is in fact now a compelling body of research and I hope that gets more conversation in 2024. The other big finding of 2023 research was out of the Shanker Institute report, which was super important. It showed that 45 states have put legislation in place to advance the science of reading costs since 2019. Um, that legislation generally ignores knowledge building, but also curriculum is seldom a centerpiece in that legislation. So um, we're in this funny space where everyone believes that curriculum really mattered to bring bad practices into classrooms, but no states or few states seem to be making curriculum the centerpiece in advancing the change. So um, a trend to watch. And journalists keep focusing on curriculum. Mostly we hear about the ones that are bad. Um, True. Sold a story and a superb series in the Boston Globe by Mandy McLaren that I hope you're watching. Um, again, less focus on the positive side of that story and the more positive developments and um, increasing angst in the literacy community about all of these trends and you know some of the, the unspoken um, concerns in the space about you know kind of are we are we and are the institutions that are really centering curriculum kind of putting a fine point on these developments so I will hush up now before I move on to the next question but uh, <laughs> and I talk too fast so forgive me for that um let me just see if there's any Shannon's running from her basil. Um, so as far as the curriculum that's out there now, you know, it. <clears throat> my concern and, you know, it's sort of a joke that I make a lot is uh, I'm going to, I, I plan on getting rich because I'm going to make a roll of gold stars stickers that say science of reading and I'm going to slap it on everything and I'm going to move forward. Um, you know, and the concern now is that there not the concern, but there is a lot of curriculum out there, but who's reviewing it to make sure that it is actually aligned with the research and that it's not just the latest catchphrase? That's such a good joke. And what I love about your gold star joke is that, you know, for more than a decade, we've been talking about this problem, but we had different language for it about mm. 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we talked about how everyone was slapping common core aligned right. on the front of their textbooks, but what was in between the covers was anything but. So this instinct, um, this rebranding, I'm going to take a sidebar because it's my favorite thing to talk about. And I want you all to keep me honest. I'm, I'm going to write a piece about this in the next month if it kills me. Um, Abby Boroff, tweet me every day if I haven't published it by the end of February. Uh, or by the way, now that you mentioned her name, um, I feel like we're friends. I know <laughs> Abby Boroff. Abby Boroff is just my the person on whose face I see who will most keep me honest. But I was um, stuffing my face earlier. That's why my camera wasn't on. So now I'm done. You yeah. must be she, honest she's on my this. on Twitter, and I refuse to call it X. So Twitter, everybody, <laughs> if you say X, I won't. I won't respond. But go ahead. So y'all are friends in this space, and and we've been following these developments. Um, a few years back, many of you may remember that Student Achievement Partners put out this um, excellent review of Teachers College Reading Workshop units of study that really spawned the conversations about the flaws with that program. And within a year, Ed Reports had put out its review. And of course, Emily Hanford's work had talked about issues with that program before that review came out, but Sold a Story really put a fine point on many of the findings in the foundational skills arena. So in the dream and dram of that, um, Lucy Calkins often put out responses in different ways. And sometimes it was about phonicators and sometimes it was about this and that. So in the same two or three month span, the SAP review comes out, Lucy Calkins and team put out a six or seven page response to the Teachers College Reading Workshop review that said two important things that no one focused on. One of the things that Calkins and team acknowledged was actually that Reading Workshop didn't necessarily have the volume of grade level texts that were specified by the standards and they probably should work on that. Got exactly zero attention other than like me and one other person tweeting about it, which is why I have to bring this back. 
Um, but the other thing that was acknowledged in the review was that actually reading workshop wasn't, they weren't even designing for knowledge building because that was the work of the content areas. And I mean, to her credit, um, Calkins had been hosting reading workshop, uh, you know, convenings and, and the, the teacher's college um, institutes gave really wonderful voice to the role of content areas instruction and the importance of it. And the role of content knowledge wasn't lost on Calkins. She just didn't think it was her bag to focus on that. She expected heavy doses of content area instruction to carry the water for knowledge building for children. And so that was kind of her defense in this, in this piece. And I thought, you know, that's all of that is surprisingly humble and, and admissions that we all should be paying attention to. And within two months, I just happened on the Heinemann website and noticed the marketing copy that they had to describe uh, the units of study product and actively builds content knowledge, like knowledge building. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, grade level texts. Both of those phrases were in the marketing copy in these like header displays that, that rotated as a carousel. And as a former K-12 uh, marketer in my time, I, you know, I, I think I just like, like snort laughed while looking at it and wrote a, a, an eye roll Twitter thread and then moved on. So we're probably all overdue to come back to some of those dichotomies between the way these products are talked about and how they're marketed. Um, but I'll come right back off my tangent at this point to talk about who's reviewing curriculum because that story, and thank you to Linda for pulling the SAP review up, is a wonderful segue to how most of what I just talked about is completely lost in the review landscape of 2023. And it's something that we really need to change in 2024. Um, take my breath and find my slides. 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 <laughs> Slides are our friends. Slides are my friends because otherwise I would just take tangents all day. <laughs> um, tell you stories of 2020 things that I meant to write about then and maybe I'll get to this year. And uh, you know, I apologize. I sort of jumped in a little uh, more quickly tonight than I tend to, but um, to everyone that here, that's here again, this is such, I'm looking at it, this, you know, this group of people and you know how, how uh, lucky we are to have these people. So please feel free to, you know, turn on your cameras if you're not laying in bed. I mean, even if you are laying in bed, we've all seen it, right? Um, and, and just, you know, jump in whenever. This is really meant to be an organic, um, intelligent conversation. So there's there's no parameters. So whenever you feel like speaking, right, Karen, am I speaking for both of us? Do you feel that way? 100%. And there are more intelligent okay. people out in that audience than myself. So, um, okay. I, so I can't okay. wait for the part where we all talk amongst ourselves in a bit. Um, but I think one of the things when I alluded to in the 2023 trends, how I see increasing angst in the space, in the literacy community, the biggest form of angst that I see is at the heart of this slide. Um, we have an increasingly complex review landscape. Um, we are in a space where most districts have normed around the idea that Ed Reports is the gold standard. Um, mm -hmm. And Ed Reports is the best known entity that is doing curriculum reviews, reviewing against the standards in a, a set of uh, review instruments that have changed a bit over time. Um, but there has been growing concern that Ed Reports, and it's not new growing concern, this is a sort of couple of year old story that really has come to a head in 2023. There's a, a fairly growing awareness that Ed Reports has done a very nice job at this point of helping to raise the importance of separating the good from the bad in curriculum and actually you know, defining a review landscape. Um, and Ed Reports did, in fact, by giving fairly pointed negative reviews to a lot of the basal readers of the first post Common Core generation. Um, and inspiring those publishers to go back and uh, make material changes to those programs. Um, Ed Reports did in fact help raise the bar for curriculum for United States districts. There's no question 
that the current generation of wonders is better than the last generation of wonders. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, Ed Reports has not necessarily kept up with some of the developments in the landscape, and there have been some quality control issues with their reviews. So lately, I hear as many questions about the accuracy of their reviews as I hear endorsements of the accuracy of their reviews. And I think we have to start to call a spade a spade that Ed Reports is directionally accurate, but it can no longer be the standard bearer for what good looks like in curriculum. And honestly, anyone who's talking honestly about the space will say that. Usually they'll say it behind the scenes and a couple of us are, are uh, bold enough to say it out loud. Um, so Ed Reports is kind of a, a, a lesser um, standard bearer at this point. And we have to figure out what do we do in the wake of that development? So there are a number of state reviews, um, but most of the states that have gone ahead and created a review program did so in partner with Ed Reports and more or less adopted the Ed Reports approach to reviewing, which is around standards alignment. So mm. Ed Report, state reviews tend to be Ed Reports light or Ed Reports you know, by another different team of educators. I'm taking for granted that most of you know the Ed Reports process is to have educators, a, a trained set of educators do the curriculum reviews. It's honestly one of the flaws in their process because over time, you know, their training standards seem to have slipped and the reviews that you get in any given cycle are as good as the review team and the training and in a lightweight training and a highly variable um, set of reviewers. It's part of why we see quality control issues with Ed Reports reviews, but in any case, State reviews have gone through, you know, kind of similar approaches to reviewing curricula. So we've got lots of state review approaches, but I'm not so sure that they're producing different outcomes than Ed Reports by and large. The best known of kind of the next generation of review instruments is the Reading League tool. Um, so the Reading League has had a review tool out. They've had a couple of generations of it. It has improved over time, like many of these instruments, but the Reading League Review Tool um, is strong on foundational skills. I'm not sure there's anything stronger, or there may be stronger things, but this is this one has great traction and for foundational skills, I would endorse it myself. But the biggest concern about that tool is that it tends to focus super heavily on foundational skills and uh, other aspects of curricula tend not to get their, their day in the sun. Um, in that tool. And the newest tool on the list that I would want to be on, to have on folks' radar screens is that the Knowledge Matters campaign has put out uh, a review tool uh, that is a very strong distillation of what the must wins are mm -hmm. from the knowledge building perspective. And since it's impossible to disentangle knowledge building from work with grade level text, from having writing that's connected to reading instruction because that too is part of the helping it stick from a knowledge perspective. Um, you'll find that tool to be the most uh, sort of nuanced I find when it comes to all of the drivers of reading comprehension. Um, but that tool only focuses on the drivers of reading comprehension and not on foundational skills. So we right. really don't have any one place that I would point people to say, this is the tool and I honestly see more tools by the day. So I feel like the space is actually increasingly complex and increasingly confusing for educators. Um, one of the sort of reality checks about where we are at the moment. I hope, um, I hope I'm not derailing the direction that you are right now, but you know, one of the things that you and I talked about and, you know, as you know, one of the hats, that I wear is the moderator of the um, the big Facebook page. And the number of which curriculum, my school is looking at this, my school is looking at that curriculum. It's, it's at a point where like, I'm having trouble doing my actual job because this question comes up so often. So the, the timing of this conversation is just so incredibly um, poignant and important. And it's, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we went live and it's a great problem to have because last year it was all about the buy-in and are we moving in this direction? And now we're moving so quickly that, you know, we're, we're in the lane, but we need the right vehicles. So, you know, with all this curriculum 
coming up in all, in all the different states. Like, is there anyone tracking it across the United States or? You know, I'm, I do, I'm gonna move in a second to a couple of gory slides that I probably won't even really get through about who's tracking what's used in the United States. And the long story short is you really have to piece a lot together to get any sense. And I don't think anyone has, anyone who's publicly publishing anything has a really clear sense of where these things are trending for reasons we'll get into in a second. But, you know, to speak authentically about where we are in this moment, um, I spent a lot of 2023 feeling guilty because I talk a lot about curriculum and I can have the privilege of knowing, um, having been in classrooms using a variety of these programs. And so I have I have all this insider knowledge and I couldn't even begin to answer all the questions that hit my DMs and come to me on my website. And it's just, there has been a deluge of interest and I don't think there have been good enough scalable ways to answer people's questions about the curriculum landscape. So this too is a catalyst in some of the 2024 work that we'll talk about in a second, but I'm I have the, exactly the same observation that if I look at the Science of Reading Facebook group, which is this important nexus of discourse about the space, I see all these posts that look like someone saying, you know, someone tell me about fill in blank and fill in blank might be a program that I esteem highly and fill in blank might be a program that I think has some question marks, but you know, or a, a bit of both. I'm My district is piloting X and Y. What do you know about them? And then I look at the responses and often the responses, and I, I don't mean this disrespectfully because I don't, I'm going to raise my hand and say, I don't have time to give substantive answers to all the, I don't most of the time. So I'm part of the problem. But then I look at the responses and the responses are often, oh, that, we use this and it's the worst, period. Or we use this and it's the worst. The writing isn't as good as as what I've used before. Or, you know, the and it's like this really simple answer that gives you a kernel of knowledge, but you don't begin to really have the kind of context to know, okay, well, what is the writing instruction like and how substantive mm -hmm. is it? And how much is there in it? Like and that's a function of no one, myself included, I raised my hand at the top of the problem list, having the time and also the collected assets to go back and give a quick substantive answer. But the challenge that we all have collectively in 2024 is to figure out how do we package what we know about these programs in a way that we can efficiently answer these questions because we're underserving everyone in the space and these daily, sometimes hourly questions, if we don't get there and get there fast, so. Right. And, and again, as a moderator on the page, um, you're much more mature than I am because typically the answer is sucks. <laughs> okay. You know, it didn't actually move us forward in any direction, but I under, you know, I also appreciate the fact that, you know, these are hardworking people out there doing their best with something that, you know, hasn't, you know, filled the need that they, that they need for their, their students. But yeah, I think I think there has to be. Uh, I, I think the time is now that it's there's more of a resource so that when the question is asked, there's more of a resource to answer the question as opposed to um, personal insights. I, you know, um, over in the chat, Abby is um, keeping all of us honest with the <laughs> most frequent exchange in the sign of of reading Facebook group of 2021, 22, 23, which curriculum would you recommend? And usually when I use the word curriculum, I usually mean full course curriculum. Yeah. By fall. That's my reflexive way of talking about curriculum. And if it isn't full course curriculum, it's a supplement. That's my vocabulary for this. So if I hear curriculum and someone doesn't say foundational skills curriculum, I assume they mean for all the things. But which curriculum would you recommend followed by Hegarty, which is a segment of a segment as a program? Um, that has been the default exchange in the Science of Reading Facebook group. And um, it has been, you know, I think that 
in this week when we're seeing the latest study and not the first study, but from the Florida Center of Reading Research to uh, note that districts using Hegarty versus districts using, unfortunately, the study didn't say exactly what else was used in the school in that district, but I think we can infer from A, FCR studying it, and B, just the way that the, the, the context of the study generally, I'm inferring that there was a foundational skills program in the other schools. They weren't doing nothing. Um, so the idea that we have the latest study of multiple showing us that Hegarty doesn't have adding Hegarty on top of a foundational skills program that incorporates phonemic awareness, but is part of um, daily systematic phonics lessons, um, that that isn't actually driving outcomes is something for us to reflect upon. And one of the questions that came earlier in the chat, and I'll try to address this better later in the conversation, but one of the questions was, well, you know, what are what are the reasons that one would say that the reading league tool doesn't honor anything outside of foundational skills? Well, I, I think we all need to, to take a moment to realize that many of the loudest voices in the conversation, and I've name checked the reading league, but they're not the only ones. They're far from the only entity in the space that has really centered foundational skills and spent most of the mind share in this conversation focusing on the speech to print, print to speech, phonemic yeah. awareness versus advanced phonemic awareness versus, I mean, the, the degree of focus on the nuances of foundational skills instruction um, to a degree that probably led everyone to believe that that's where it's at and contributed to the reasons that we see everyone right up to Mark Seidenberg going out of their way to ask whether all of that has gone a bit overboard. Yeah, um, Lynn Stone too. Lynn Stone had a, a piece on it. We could have an entire Zoom chat just about that dosage conversation. Um, yeah. That That is all worthy of a moment of reflection. Yeah. So sure. I, when I introduce this as a conversation about curriculum, I don't just mean foundational skills and I mean all of it. And we really can't totally take the tangent on on all of that. But I think for everyone to take a moment and realize that it's not just journalists, it's also many of the leading voices in our space that have focused so heavily in one part of the instructional, on one part of the ELA block, that they probably led a lot of districts to believe that that was the part of the ELA block. And much of the experimentation and adding of supplements has been in that part of the ELA block, which probably has in districts that leaned in in that direction, expanded beyond its share of the ELA block that dosage conversation is a lot of where we have to be in 2024. Yeah. And, and Lynn, I, 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 your point so resonates with me, uh, Karen, she's, you know, Lynn just said that we are in a profession where um, we have to get it right. You know, and, and um, actually I'm not going to paraphrase because it was written really beautifully. We, we serve in a profession that wants to get it right. And it's too muddy to be black and white. Hence the overcorrection. People talk about these things as pendulum swings because there are often overcorrections. And I, I'm not, um, I could have an entire Zoom chat about things I got wrong in K-12 education. I did a stint in a, a, a literacy program, working for a literacy program that was in the ed tech space that um, today, because kids were reading on digital devices, based on what I've learned from um, work of so many important leaders in this space, I would no longer begin to recommend that product that I worked for eight years ago, right? Nobody has gotten it all right. And I'm, I'm, you know, the lead learner on this call. Um, but I'd like to see a lot more straight talk about the things we recommended a couple years ago that now we don't, or what does it look like to kind of write the balance, right? I think the right sizing of of foundational skills instruction, the right sizing of many of these aspects of um, literacy instruction, the right sizing of skills and strategy, the best dosage for knowledge. Um, this is where the heart of the conversation if we're really going to get it right. And we need to embrace that not as a, um, not just as a like who got it wrong, but just as a, you know, okay, I got it wrong at one point. So what's my best understanding today? 
and how do we keep pushing each other toward our best understanding tomorrow? I, I think that's the essence of where we need to be moving forward. But that's going to require a lot of organizations, including states, to say the best understanding of curriculum reviews in 2017 was Ed Reports. I personally like tweeted and name checked Ed Reports like every other day because that was the important advancing of change back then. Right. And now I'm telling you they're directionally accurate and no better. That's my own version of let me tell you the straight talk about how these things evolve because they're going to keep evolving and we've got to stay current. So <clears throat> is it okay if I ask you now what what you see the road ahead for 2024? Yes. Um I am I'm I'm going to, you know, quickly the honor idea that the executive summary um of because I promised to answer this question, who's actually tracking curriculum usage? The short answer is no one is tracking it well. Um, the organization that is best funded to track it is RAND, but uh, RAND is funded by the same people who fund Ed Reports, and their definition of high quality is what Ed Reports calls high quality. So if too many curricula have been given all greens and high quality reviews by Ed Reports, RAND is only as good as the instrument that lies beneath it. So the only organization that has consistent funding to do yearly dipsticks into what's used is using an unfortunately flawed metric. Um, beyond that, no one is tracking what's used in schools in a sort of steady and consistent way. There are four states, and I'm going to shout them out because, my God, we need to like ask every state to do exactly uh, what these four states are doing. Um, so remember how to screen share. I can still do this, you guys. Um, <laughs> there are four states that are publishing what curricula are used in their schools. They've done so at different moments in time. So none of these are, are perfect instruments or show us perfect senses of change. But Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, and Nebraska have all been publishing information on what curricula are used in their schools. And if you do one thing, um, besides ask your state leaders for whatever else you think is missing, please ask your state leaders to publish this information because these resources are godsends. And frankly, the Massachusetts tracker is the heart of why we're getting amazing coverage out of the Boston Globe because that reporter has a data source. So um, this is one development that I, I, I keep hoping that in the, at the end of two years, there are like 48 states on this list. Mm. But back to what do I see in 2024? Um, I see a lot of things. I expect to see continued journalism. I expect to see continued discussion about dosage. I expect to see continued discussion about the right sizing of uh, what should be happening in the literacy block and how we uh, make sure that we aren't overcorrecting in any particular directions. Um, mm. I um, I love what Linda's mentioning. She can never find the curriculum listed on school mm. and district websites. If I could change one thing and wave a magic wand, I would uh, have a requirement that all districts have to publish the curriculum used and also the five-year reading and math score trends on their home pages. Yep. That would change K-12 education, but um, that's probably less likely than the other policy changes I suggested before. So pick your poison when you write your state leaders. Um, but I, I do wanna take a moment before I hush up uh, and, and ask the brilliant people on this call to please chime in the things I've missed um, to, to uh, give you all a sneak preview, I'm going to call it, of some work that a few of you on this call are a part of. Um, I've had to be in my bonnet about all these developing trends and the fact that too few people are willing or able or have the capacity or time or energy to go solve these problems. And the number one conversation I keep having is why is no one in particular uh, explaining the flaws with many of these still popular programs 
balanced literacy programs that go beyond foundational skills, a la the story that we discussed earlier uh, about um, Reading Workshop and its marketing team. Um, and also, why is no one addressing the fact that Everports has become a diminished source of reviews when everyone knows that all green on Everports doesn't mean what it used to. And in fact, some of the best curricula in the country don't have all green on Everports. Why isn't anyone screaming from the void about that clearly and transparently? Um, that problem has kept me up at night for all of 2023. And, and the best of you on this call and some who are not on this call have helped push problem solving into 2024. So in the next few months, what you'll see is the launch of a project that has um, the affectionate name, the Curriculum Insight Project, um, an effort between communities of educators who are coming together, who use some of the programs that are all green on ed reports, but shouldn't be. And at least one program that is not all green on ed reports and should be to collaboratively publish not reviews because review implies some sort of highly rigid and almost dense uh, output about a, a program, but to publish summaries of the look for's about what we all need to know about those programs in really tangible and concise ways uh, to help districts take action. Uh, and we're, we're taking this project on with this particular adoption season in mind. So I think you'll be seeing a lot about this project in the next few months because um, behind the scenes, a number of educators are busy, uh, you know, putting pen to paper and screen to screenshots um, about why we need to take seriously the concerns. We hear murmurings of concerns about interreading, and it's not up to snuff relative to other programs and some of the others, but it's time to actually distill why these programs, what the quality gaps are relative to what evidence-based practices look like. So um, watch this space. And in part, I'm grateful to, uh, to Virginia for hosting this conversation because we're just starting to talk about this project that a number of us have been working on for a while, but we're still recruiting more educators to this project because- Say we, the name again, Karen, one more, say that name again. The, the Curriculum name Insight Project. project. We, haven't, we haven't even put out a press release. We haven't debuted a thing. We have a Twitter handle and not much more, but we have collaborative teams of educators who really want to distill clearly some of the gaps in quality for some of the programs that are already well known and um, hanging out in classrooms and getting phonics patch like Reading Workshop and Fountas and Pinnell. We're going to talk about the gaps in areas beyond foundational skills so that it's clear to K-12 what those gaps are in other critical areas like, are all children working with grade level texts? And what is the volume of work with quality texts in a given year? Um, I could go on about what's happening in my own daughter's classrooms where reading workshop involves surprisingly little reading of full texts in a given year. Um, another tangent I won't take right now, but give me time. Um, and we're going to also put a spotlight on some of those programs that have these all greens and are marching into districts because they have big publishers behind them and big marketing teams behind them, but just don't begin to stand up to the quality levels of the highest quality programs in the space. So hopefully this effort will redefine what high quality curriculum is and bring tangibility to a conversation that needs it. But with that, I've talked way too long tonight and I see all these brilliant faces on the screen. So I'm gonna hush up. And actually, I, I just hope we turn over to what other people have to say, because I'm talking enough. Well, I think first I just have to acknowledge um, Linda's snapping and clapping. <laughs> That's It's been a great night, but if I could just, the snapping and clapping has been fantastic. You have got to turn your microphone on first. You have so much to say, I'm dying. <laughs> I I am so like, like this I am so glad that I made time to join tonight because this is like <laughs> I just like copied an entire paragraph from my latest thoughts on newsletters. 
this is where I am. Um, and I, the, I, in addition to these review tools evolving, I think too, um, it's too easy to ignore that a curriculum that comes recommended in for a particular district or school or area or region um, may not also then be the best fit for their neighbor right. <laughs> because so much matters about the students we serve, the structures that are in place to support teachers with planning, the budget that the school district has to invest in the training that then gets teachers what they need to be able to implement well. And I just, I feel like when you're missing um, those additional complexities and people aren't asking those questions as a part of their review process, you might adopt a curriculum that is fantastic on paper and then fails to implement the change that you're seeking. I'll, I'll stop there. I'm gonna take a half a second to respond to that because it's completely and utterly true and yet, when I was at Open Up Resources, because the last time, the only time that I had a, a marketing job for um, one of the K-12 curriculum products, or a few that I'm really still um, proud to have you know, helped advance, by the way, your son's role, um, in, in the K-12 landscape, we talked at the time, and this was five, six years ago, about the need for a Surgeon General's warning on our products that if you didn't get PD with it, you would fail. And I would say that about every single high quality program, period, end of story. So I agree with what you're saying that there needs to be more attention given to the need for support for teachers. But the coda that I would add to that is, I'm not sure that we can say that for a few of the high quality options, but not others. They all need support. Some are more challenging to adopt than others. That is, I, I do think we need more transparency about the fact that some are a slightly heavier lift and and some require more of a, you know, um, we're going to talk more about bookworms in the next year, I'm sure, because that yeah. program has so much evidence behind it. But yeah. sometimes people talk about it like it's easy to implement. And I think in practical terms, Sharon's done a great job of making that a very usable curriculum for teachers if the school day is restructured. And I, I we need to talk authentically about the fact that you actually have to restructure your school day to use Bookworms. So straight talk about all of these programs, including the very best ones, and Bookworms is on that list, yeah. is necessary. I'm going to be honest about the fact that this project is going to have straight talk about the lower quality ones first, because before we let them march into more classrooms, we should talk about you, you talk about the issues with the weaker stuff before you talk about the reality checks about the best stuff. That's just, that's just good hygiene, in my personal opinion. Um, but yeah, in general, we need a lot more straight talk about how you find right fit across districts in a country that has, uh, you know, high fragmentation and, um, I mean, there are 14,000 plus school districts in America. We're kidding ourselves if we think that any one of the really awesome options, and there are a number of them at this point, is the right thing for all. You know, and, and the truth is, just practically speaking, um, weeding out the ineffective first is incredibly effective because once a decision is made and once the money is paid, if it proves itself to be ineffective, it won't matter because schools won't have the budgets to replace it. So the decision is just so incredibly important because there's, it, I've never seen anyone backpedal and say, oh, yeah, 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 never should have made that decision. Let's pick a new curriculum next year. It's like, we'll, we'll look at this again in 10 years. So there's a generation of kids that will be getting an ineffective curriculum. So, you know, you, you have to, I think it's imperative to just eliminate the, the least effective first because we don't want them. Uh, Susan, if you're comfortable turning on your own microphone, that was a really great question, but I'm happy to read it for you. But if you want to jump in, um, please do. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Welcome. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I was sitting here reading everything. I'm like, oh my God, what did I ask? What was it about? <laughs> and oh my gosh. <laughs> um, 
with it is it, you know, I hear about, you know, uh, discontent with ed reports and, you know, what it doesn't do for us now um, about the reading league uh, tool and it only really addressing the foundational skills and not the others um, doing a good, you know, job of that. Um, and so those were things that I, you know, I kind of wanted to bring to as a, as a classroom teacher, um, and I, I happen to just be that nerd, um, who worked, you know, I did curriculum specialist for SPED. So, you know, I might have a little more knowledge than your average teacher, um, about how, you know, you can go ahead and make you know, recommendations or decisions or how to look through curriculum, because we're at in, in South Carolina, you know, we're at a real pivotal point. Uh, this year, we adopt a new curriculum. Um, and and the state has um, done a year long kind of work on um, what was going to be on the state list. So now we have five curriculum um, to to select from. And you know, you want to look at those and you want to, uh, you know, what things can you look at um, with this uh, and, and make the best possible decisions? Um, because you're right, it's, it's, a, it's gonna be a cost. We're gonna, we're gonna have this curriculum for at least five years. Right now with the, the fastest, um, growing area. And, and I, I don't mean just simply growing bigger. I mean, refining growing. I mean, we're in first, maybe second iterations of curriculum that are going to probably align better with, with um, evidence-based practices. Um, and I, th I think you're going to see lots of new additions happening and revised as they get in and pilot and some is more solidified. So I really think that what's adoptable today is going to look different in five years because of that refinement. Um, so, you know, what do we, what do we use today? You know, um, I have used ed reports. Um, I don't tend to look at just a, what are their greens? Okay. Yeah. I look at that. I like to look at what the reviewer comments had to say, like their explanations for why they rated. That kind of gives me lenses into what was seen or or disparaged or was missing in that. Um, I use the Reading League tool. Um, it does have foundational skills, but it also does have language comprehension and reading comprehension and writing in it and assessment um, as well. So, you know, using that tool as well, the Knowledge Matters campaign came out with its own to look at, at just specific part of a curriculum. They're very clear about, you know, look, we're not your, your everything this is a part this is a niche part but look at this to evaluate that curriculum so it's kind of multiples that get kind of uh put together it's kind of like you know when we talk about identifying a problem we say triangulate the data okay well let's triangulate from different sources of what is the best picture is is, yeah. is like the only way i can think to do um oh, from this perspective right you rightly summarize where things are and I guess the the sort of really hard reality of this moment when I was alluding to the complexity of the review space is that unfortunately there isn't one there definitely isn't one review instrument that has spit out the answer mm -hmm. and there isn't even one review instrument that gives you the right inputs it's a really complicated space right now Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take away from the fact that the options today are better than they were five years ago. So mm -hmm. it, it isn't all bad, but for those of us who really want to push toward the very best thing right now, knowing that whatever is adopted this year isn't leaving classrooms for five years or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It isn't getting replaced by something better for five years. It might be in the back of the classrooms in one year, but it mm -hmm. isn't getting replaced by something new for five years. Right. The urgency of that reality is very much felt by those of us who want to center discussions mm -hmm. of what good looks like this year and accelerate those discussions. If somebody doesn't call on Jan Hasbrook, I'm uh, you the the one of the most brilliant women in the country. I'm just to say, I'd like to exploit night. the fact that my microphone is on and ask you to turn your microphone on. I would hate for an opportunity to go by and not to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> You're hearing from me. Hi. Hey, Karen. Jan has an amazing new book that I can't wait to read in, um, that I pre-ordered this afternoon. So Jan, thank you for your work. And I'd yeah. love to know your thoughts on this topic or any other. <laughs> uh, well, you're all, all right. You are all correct <laughs> in this conversation about the importance of, of curriculum, uh, the value of the essential tool. I mean, the analogy when that I always go back to when I think about curriculum for we teachers um, it, are the tools of a carpenter. <laughs> you know, you've got to have a toolkit. Um, uh, there are other more probably finessed professional analogies we could use, but you've got to have tools showing up every day for a carpenter to build a house and have to invent his tools or go on carpenters pay carpenters or, <laughs> or um, CPC. It's just, yeah, right. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's patently ridiculous. And that how helpful it would be to have a really good trustworthy tool that was comprehensive that we all could could trust and and use um and and it's complicated this is really complicated stuff there there's there isn't going to ever be the perfect curriculum that you just buy it take it out of its package and use it uh with without with with all children and have success but we can get a core uh, that does a better job and, uh, or the best job that we can do. You know, I really, I was thinking tonight uh, as some of these conversations were happening about that uh, hilarious, I mean, so true all over um, the internet, teachers just desperately hearing about the science of reading, wanting to get connected with it and, and piping in what curriculum should I use? Um, or, or, you know, I'm using the XYZ program and what do you think? Oh, it's wonderful. It got all green on Ed Reports. I hate it. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's like, but I think some of that comes from the way a whole lot of teachers have been trained with very simplistic notion about what teaching is. You know, just love your kids, have a cozy corner, um, match them to their level, give them just right books and teach them all these cutesy things like, you know, Skippy the Frog and all that, and you're done. And like, no, we want to take all that away from you and give you science <laughs> and this incredibly complex stuff that includes words like dosage. I mean, dosage doesn't fit with cozy corners, um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear Karen that that word is on your radar because it's 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 one that uh, comes up in conversations among researchers all the time who are doing research like I do and the translation of research into something meaningful for teachers. Um, dosage is part of what we have to do. Uh, Susan is asking a question about the book. I really appreciate that uh, the student focused coaching book, not student-centered. That's a different model. Um, and I can talk to you about that sometime. But student-focused coaching is a book that uh, has been out now for a while. Uh, Nancy Young and I, and if I stop talking, I'll, I'll put it in a link to it. Nancy Young and I edited a book, uh, has 20 chapters in it. It's a book about her infographic, climbing the, the, the ladder of reading and writing. And the book is called, there it is, thank you. Linda, 
uh, climbing the ladder of reading and writing, 20 chapters written by some of the literally world's experts in different topics about um, the need to, that climbing the ladder of re to become a reader writer is a process. And some, all of our students are going to have different levels of ease climbing the ladder. Some are gonna walk into kindergarten the first day and they've already climbed the ladder. Um, and some of our children are gonna climb it one rung at a time. Um, and some children are going to climb and slip and, and all that kind of stuff. So the book is about um, how do we meet the needs in a real classroom uh, for all of our students, including our, our advanced readers, our students with dyslexia, our students with developmental language disorders, our children with ADHD, um, our children who speak languages other than English. Um, uh, we have experts writing short, little accessible chapters on all of those things. That's it. I'm going back on mute. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> I, I'm prepared to stay here for three more hours just to hear Jan keep talking anyone else raise your hand if you'll stay here till midnight um thank you jan um there's so much more that we have to get right than the things we can focus on and that's the oversimplification of everything that everyone just said tonight but um but yeah thank you jan and what other questions or what other resources can we share um and thank you for everyone who's already stayed on longer than expected. Um, who I'm, I'm going to warn you all, I'm going to email you all to corral you into the efforts to help recruit folks to this fledgling effort to bring better transparency to the space. Because I'm, I'm just going to presume from your presence at this hour that you're the true believers. But I did see a hand from Stephanie. So. Yeah. So my question, thank you. I just happened upon this on Twitter today. I'm Twitter. It's not X, it's Twitter. No, never, um, never X. That's ridiculous. Yeah, no more. And it, I just happened upon your post. Um, I work for the Iowa Reading Re Research Center and we are starting a big curriculum project. Um, number one, I would love to connect with you. <laughs> Um, but number two, uh, so what do you recommend? What do we do when we're looking at um, curricula? Are, are we utilizing the Knowledge Matters tool with the Reading Leagues tool with the digging into ed reports? And then we we have, we're creating some things that we we feel need to be in curriculum that aren't explicitly stated in either the knowledge uh, matters or the reading leagues. Um, is that what you're, you know, what would you recommend? You just summarized where everyone is who's thinking about this now, which is this moment of triangulation of a few of these tools are doing incredibly important work of distilling a part of the problem very well. No one tool has distilled everything perfectly. Um, it sounds like I'm not the only one who's been working with some thoughtful educators in my midst to help distill what does good look like if you had to take it up a level mm -hmm. and try to synthesize all those key things, including some key things that are maybe not named by those tools. I know I'll speak for, uh, I, one should never say a statement like, I'll speak for Kareem Weaver because if anyone speaks for himself better than anyone, um, it is the amazing Kareem. But uh, after a lot of conversations with Kareem, there's one thing I know he would say if he was here, it is, where is, does it work in the conversation? Um, so there are these variables that are decidedly left out by those tools that need to be recentered in questions of how do we synthesize information about a program? Um, and that's not the only thing that has been left out of our efforts to, to synthesize all of this information about programs and all of the key variables we should look at. So in the next few weeks, you will see the crack that our team at the Curriculum Insight Project has taken at trying to summarize the key look-fors about a program from does it work 
to, does it have strong foundational skills to, does it adequately do knowledge building to the rest of the things we've put on our list? You can probably predict them. It's a late hour. I'm not going to itemize. Um, you'll see our crack at it. I no, look forward, frankly, to seeing your crack at it. So yes, we should connect afterwards. And I would love to hear what your list looks like. But I do think 2024 will be this moment of trying to, uh, for those of us who are trying to push this conversation forward um, in the most practical ways, it is about how do we honor the fact that there is in the average school a two and a half at best to two hours at most uh, literacy block in the average school and a lot of important things that schools need to get right. And we can't abandon teachers by acting like it's every teacher's or every district job to figure that out. We need thought leaders in our space to better articulate what the must wins look like. And we definitely need to better distill which curricula achieve those must wins inside of that two to two and a half hour block and which ones don't. And uh, that illumination will hopefully keep pushing the conversation. Fantastic. Yeah. Any uh, last thoughts from anyone? Last questions? Dad jokes? Please, no bad dad jokes. Please, no. please, I'm begging you. Uh, Karen, you are you are just one of the most intelligent people that I know. I Every time I talk to you, I leave smarter. So thank you and I... Uh, I I I am personally very much looking forward to this, and I'm I'm waiting for um, Linda snaps, and I didn't get them, so I'm going to say that again. I am very thank you very much. Okay, I got the snap, <laughs> and thank you everyone here, particularly Dr. Hasberg, for um, shining your light on us as well. Truly lucky and blessed and smarter. Um, so can't wait to see what's next. And thank you very much, everybody. Go to bed. You all look sleepy. No, you don't. You look great. <laughs> Thank you, guys.